Good evening. Thank you for um, joining us this evening. My name is Jill Lilly and I'm the um, ACAP coordinator for Center County. Uh, we have a great program. I know that um, the topic of dementia is always a hot topic. So um, I will pass this over to Cindy in one second. We do need to thank our core sponsors who um, support us. And that would be um, Encompass. It would be the Office of Aging, and the County Office of Aging, um, uh, Juniper, and um, the Grain Hospice. So we're very appreciative of them. And without any further ado, I will turn this over to Cindy Keith. Hello, thank you for being here tonight. Can everyone hear me okay? I do have kind of a loud voice. But if you can't, just go like this, because I know what that means. I wear hearing aids. So even though you can hear me and understand me, when you talk to me, I probably can't understand you. So you might have to shout. That's okay. I'm used to it. Thank you, Jill, for asking me to be here, and thank you to ACAP. Uh, because the topic of dementia is so huge, please consider my talk tonight to be pretty much made up of bullet points, because there are so many important topics that I want to touch on, and it's uh, you're, you're going to just have to forgive me from jumping from one topic to the next without those scenic bridges in between. Uh, also, I'll be using him and his or she and her at times throughout my talk. I'm speaking about all elders with some form of dementia, but it just makes it easier to assign genders at times. And are you all aware that the term dementia is the umbrella term? You're all aware of that. Good. Okay. Um, many types underneath. Alzheimer's is the most common. Now, do any of you consider yourselves to be a nurturing person? Nurturing? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. I think most women would tend to say that. I believe that quality is essential when you're responding to any actions from an elder with some type of dementia. You, you need to have that nurturing quality. And everybody and everything needs to be nurtured. The rose garden in your lawn, um, the, the animal, the puppy, the baby, your families, crops in the field. If they don't receive care in a nurturing manner, they don't thrive. They just don't do as well. They may grow up, but they just don't do as well. And this has been proven for animals as well as humans. It's called failure to, to thrive. Well, people with dementia especially need to be nurtured because they've lost the ability to make sense of the world around them now. So I want you to just try to imagine what it might be like to have dementia. So imagine yourself waking up in your bed tomorrow morning and you open your eyes and you start to think about all the things that you want to do today. Well, first, you need to go to work. So you get dressed, you go into the kitchen where your spouse or your partner is sitting and you look around to try to find your car keys. And your spouse says, what are you doing? And you say, I can't find my car keys. I have to get to work. And with a very sad expression, your wife, husband says to you, honey, don't you remember the doctor told you after that last accident that you're not allowed to drive anymore? You don't remember being told that. You don't remember any accident. So how do you feel in that moment? How do you feel? I mean, angry, sad, helpless. Yeah. 
That's why I feel it's imperative that all caregivers of an elder with dementia adopt a nurturing manner with these elders because they truly cannot help themselves. They're feeling all those emotions over and over again, day in and day out, constantly, until the dementia progresses where they forget. And they're relatively happy unless you're making them try to do something they don't want to do. So when you respond to them in a nurturing manner, and you're letting them know in your every word, gesture, and tone that you're on their side, then you're making their lives better in that moment. And you're also likely making your own life better because when they're happy, you're happy. Is this easy to do? No. It's probably the hardest thing you'll ever have to do if you have a loved one with some form of dementia. How many of you have ever tried to reason or argue with an elder with dementia? First time I did that, he had me up against the wall with his hands around my throat. I learned real quick, <laughs> this is not the way to interact with them. <laughs> so the point I want to make is that when people with dementia have lost the ability to understand reasoning, just as as they have lost the ability to remember that they've asked the same question over and over six times already. So because you're likely to just get into an argument with them, if you try to reason with them or reorient them to your reality, I suggest you always let them win, unless it's a big safety issue. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought it was Monday today. And it is Monday, but they're insisting it's Sunday. Okay, fine, let them win and apologize. So in that example I gave, instead of trying to reorient the spouse to the fact that he has no more driving privileges, you would instead smile and say, I am going to help you find those keys after breakfast. You just delay, sit with me, have a cup of coffee and we'll have some breakfast first. You get them interested in something else, and they're usually going to forget what they were focused on. The more familiar the suggestion and situation is to them, and what's not familiar about the kitchen, sitting down for a cup of coffee and having breakfast, then the likelier they are to respond positively towards you. Nurturing helps with dignity. When interacting with this loved one, if you're not maintaining their dignity or you're treating them like a child and they will know it, it's going to upset them. And when they're upset, are they likely to willingly do what you want them to do without an argument? No. So if they get upset, I want to say a word about your own safety as a caregiver. It's extremely important that you keep yourself safe. If you notice, I'm going to say him because men are so much bigger and stronger. Over time, becoming more short tempered, making threatening remarks or gestures, he needs to be seen by his physician as soon as possible and possibly be put on a medication to take the edge off of that anger or maybe be taken off a medication he was recently put on because he's not reacting well to it. You cannot go by, he would never lift a hand to me. He's never raised a hand to me in anger. He never even spanked our children. No, I had an LPN in the Dementia Dedicated <laughs> Assisted Living, a sweet little gentleman who was a school I don't know, principal or something, never spanked his children, never raised a hand to his wife, grabbed my LPN around the neck, threw her against the windows and fractured her collarbone. We don't know why. We have no idea. There's all bets are off when dementia starts damaging the brain. It can happen with women as well. I worked in a geriatrician's office 
and one man would bring his wife in for her care. He was very attentive, very patient with her. She was in the later stages. She could still walk, but she didn't talk much at all. And one day I was taking her blood pressure and I'm listening to the stethoscope. She turns to her husband and she says, in this tone of voice, I am going to kill you. I am going to get a knife and stab you. <laughs> and he smiled and said, yes, dear, we'll talk about that when we get home. <laughs> And I said to him afterwards, does she talk about this often? And he said, sometimes. He said, so we just make sure the knives are all out of reach. <laughs> you just don't know. It's not that unusual to see major changes in a person's personality when the dementia is beginning to destroy those social barriers and those breaks and controls in the brain. And since you can't change that, it's extremely important that you change your reactions to them because your reaction is going to be what dictates their next action. I want you to remember this. If you remember nothing else I say tonight, your body language speaks louder to an elder with dementia than your words do because they no longer remember what all those words mean. And because reading body language is something we all do unconsciously. Animals, especially dogs, dogs are masters at reading body language. Even infants can read body language. Think about it. I'm standing up here giving this talk about dementia and it's really interesting. And you want to get it all, but every now and then I start to speak in Greek and you don't speak Greek. So what are you automatically doing? Besides thinking negative thoughts about me, you're going to be watching my body language, my facial expressions, my tone of voice, my gestures. How do I hold my body? You're going to listen, see if you can catch a word or a phrase now and then that you might recognize. This is exactly what people with dementia do because the words don't all make sense to them anymore. They do this every time you talk to them. When I give staff trainings to facility employees, I give this example about body language. You've had a big fight with your significant other just before leaving for work that morning and you're right and they're wrong as usual. You're still upset about this when you get to work. And your first job is to go in and get the residents into the dining room for breakfast. So you go to Bill's room and you know Bill sometimes doesn't like to go to breakfast. They're still thinking about this argument. And you walk up to Bill and you say, come on, Bill, time for breakfast. You think Bill's going to want to go anywhere with you? Hmm, probably not. Hey, Bill, good morning. How are you? Let's go have some coffee. It's simple, but it's not always easy to do. Okay, another example of using body language. When I wor worked as a healthcare coordinator in a dementia dedicated assisted living, my office had a visitor's chair in there, and this gentleman with Lewy body dementia. I'll call him Harry, would come and often he would sit in my visitor's chair and sometimes he'd nod off and you know, I'd talk to him now and then. And one day he came into my office and stood in front of my desk and I looked up at him and I said, good morning, Harry, how are you? He said, I'm fine, honey, how are you? I said, I'm good. I said, why don't you have a seat over here and take a load off? Okay, honey, he said, and he stood there. I said, Harry, have a seat on the chair over there. Okay, honey, he said, and he stood there, dawned on me. Today, Harry's Lewy body dementia is a little worse. He's not understanding, <coughs> excuse me, my words. So I get up, I walk over to the chair, I pat the chair and I say, Harry, sit here. And he does. That's what it took that morning for him to get my message. 
it wasn't like that usually. <clears throat> so keep phrases short and simple. And when they don't seem to understand them the first time, rephrase them and use gestures. I mentioned a few minutes ago about how people with dementia are always looking for something familiar. So one very effective way to keep them calm and happy is to give them something familiar when they're confused and searching. How many of you have been in a facility and you see a person going down the hall, opening every door they come to? What are they doing? Looking for something familiar. Sometimes they're shopping, but <laughs> <laughs> usually they're looking for something familiar. So if your spouse with dementia is getting antsy or agitated and it's not caused by pain or a sudden illness like a UTI, bring a familiar object or introduce a familiar topic of conversation to their damaged mind. Uh, I was an LPN before I became an RN and I when I became an LPN, my first position was as a kind of companion care to an elderly woman. She was about 85 in the nursing home, very tiny, white haired. She had dementia. She didn't walk much. She talked a little bit, but not much. And I could keep her entertained for a while. Sometimes she would just start crying and I would have no idea what she was crying about. So I had to think of ways to get, stop her from crying. And this was probably one of my first introductions to an elder with dementia and what do I do? So she had a bookshelf and on the bookshelf were, were two uh, hand-blown glass birds. One was bright red and one was bright blue. So when she would become sad, I would take one of the birds and I would put it in my hand like I was offering her a gift. And I would say, look what I have for you. She would stop crying. She would say, oh, I said, isn't it beautiful? She would take it and she would stroke it. I said, it's for you. And she would look at me like she couldn't believe I had given her this precious gift. And this is what I would do every time she became upset. And it worked every time. And when she passed on, her daughter asked me if there was something of hers that I would like to keep as a reminder. And I chose the bluebird. And I still have it. So when I worked in the dementia dedicated assisted living, I often had residents come to me with questions or requests since my office was near the front and frequently open. One uh, delightful little 90-year-old woman came to my office one day and asked, excuse me, but have you seen my mother? I'm supposed to wait here for her. She's picking me up now, and I can't find her. Well, if I had tried to gently remind her, <laughs> orient her, that she's 90 years old and her mother died 40 years ago, how do you suppose she would have reacted to that? Either she would believe me and mourn her loss all over again. And oh my goodness, she's realized she, she's forgotten her mother died. How can you forget something like that? How horrible. Or she would become angry with me or argue with me because she just saw her mother a short time ago. She knows she's not 90 years old. Why am I saying these awful things? She may even get so upset with me that she wants to hit me. So instead, I would engage her in conversation about her mother because her mother is obviously on her mind right now. Something like, oh, tell me what your mom looks like so I can watch out for her. Does she look just like you? Okay. Well, does she drive a car? What kind of car? And what do you suppose she's going to make for supper tonight? Do you like roast beef and scalloped potatoes? See, what I'm doing is shifting her mind off of mom onto other topics. And so I'm redirecting her thinking. 
And uh, if she persists by remembering she's being picked up by mother very soon, I would say something like, no, I have not seen her, but you know, now that I know she looks just like you, I'll be on the lookout for her. And you know, right away, as soon as I see her, I will tell you, and I would too. I would tell your mom. Then I would take her over and try to get her interested in an activity to get her mind off of mom and onto something else. So by getting into her reality and not bringing her into this reality, by talking about mom, good memories, familiar memories, then redirecting the conversation and her mind elsewhere. I was helping keep her calm and happy with dignity. Now, pets or music are often great ways to redirect someone's thoughts, even if that pet is no longer alive. You keep pictures around to reminisce. The one gentleman we had in the in the facility, and he, he would sometimes sundown, which is becoming a lot more agitated and active later in the afternoon. And we learned that when he did that was to say, hey, Bill, what kind of dog was that you had again? Because we knew he had a picture of that dog on his wall. He loved that dog. So he would stop, talk about the dog, and he would settle down. So maintaining dignity is a huge issue with people with dementia. Back to that scenario I started out with where you have dementia and you're looking for your car keys. What if your partner had said this to you? Oh, for heaven's sakes, you haven't been able to drive for six months. The doctor said you can't because you're not safe anymore. Now just stop looking for those stupid keys and sit down here and have some breakfast. Sounds like something I'd say if I were frustrated. Yeah. But that's not going to make you feel better, is it? Am I treating you like a child? Yes, I am. Are you going to know it? Yes, you are. And you're not going to be happy. It's hard. It's hard because you're on 24-7. And sometimes <laughs> that's the last nerve <laughs> that they just get. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But. So remember, the more you can treat this elder with dementia, with respect and dignity, in a nurturing manner, the happier and more calm they're going to be. They're going to be more cooperative. And guess what? Your job as caregiver is easier if they're more calm and happy. Now, because I'm a nurse, and nurses always like to tell people what to do. I want you to be aware of signs that your loved one may have some type of illness or pain, because that definitely affects how they're behaving and acting. This person won't necessarily be able to tell you they have a stomach ache, or that it hurts when they try to urinate, or they feel dizzy when they stand up. They can't find words for that. So what happens when they have these things? Their behavior is going to change. Everyone's different, but you're gonna watch for the sign that indicates the change from what is normal for this person. You know what's normal for this person. Are they normally calm and content during the day? But today they're restless. They can't seem to get comfortable, not normal. Are they normally quite active, moving from one thing to another, like a five-year-old keeping you on your toes? But today they're sitting quietly in a recliner, dozing off now and then. And you're probably thinking, oh, now maybe I can get some work done around here. Yeah, not normal, sorry. Does the person normally eat well, but today refuses all solid foods and only drinks liquids? Not normal. Is the person normally happy, but today over breakfast switches from crying to laughing three times? Not normal. Always, always suspect an illness or pain to be present 
when your loved one is acting or reacting in a manner that's different from their normal. Urinary tract infections or UTIs are frequently the culprit, especially in women. Why? Because they forget they're supposed to wipe from front to back and they start wiping like they did when they were little girls and it didn't matter so much. And they give themselves a UTI. Pain from a chronic condition like arthritis or osteoporosis can cause mood swings or agitation. And even if you ask them, does something hurt? You, you need to ask it three different ways because that might not mean anything to them. And they might say yes when they mean no. So you have to not just ask once in one way. Refusing solid foods might indicate a sore in the mouth they can't tell you about. One of our residents in a long-term care facility or the a assisted living facility, the staff person, the aide came to me at breakfast and said, June, is refusing all solid foods. She won't keep her teeth in and she's only drinking liquids. And I asked her if, she, if something hurt and she said no. So I went out there and I sat down and I said, good morning, June. She said, hi. I said, how are you today? I'm fine, she said. I said, well, that's good. I said, don't you like your breakfast this morning? Oh, it's okay. I said, do you want to eat some eggs here? No. June, can you tell me, does something hurt in your mouth? No. I said, well, can I look in your mouth? She had a big sore on her gum. Had the dentist come in that afternoon, it was cancer. Fast growing aggressively. And she didn't want her teeth in because it bothered, but she couldn't tell you. So you need to be aware if these people are working on a UTI or they have a sore or they have increased pain or from a chronic condition, they're at a much higher risk for falling or becoming agitated, <laughs> striking out at you and ending up in the ER. One of our residents, Pearl was her name, would walk around the circle all day long. That's all she would do. She would walk around. That's what she did. She was happy most of the time. One day, the LPN came to me and said, Pearl's walking faster. I think something's wrong with her. And I looked at her, and she was walking faster. And she was holding her arm like this. So we stopped her. But she wouldn't stop. She, she, she kept moving like this. And she couldn't answer our questions. So I took her in the room, and I had her lay down. And I was palpating her abdomen, and she seemed tender. So I sent her to the ER and she had a bowel obstruction. She was walking faster and faster to try and outwalk the pain. And what would have happened if the nurse had not noticed that? She would have fallen, maybe broken something, and still had the bowel obstruction. Mm -hmm. By being aware of possible reasons behind some of these behaviors, you can avoid having the situation progress to a fall or a visit to the ER. I want to say a few words about when a caregiver has to make the gut-wrenching decision to place that loved one into a facility. I actually have a whole chapter on that in my book on this topic. And I could speak today on the topic. But it's often the most difficult decision families will face. The guilt that they feel over not being able to provide the care can crush many spouses. They may have promised their wife or their husband to never put them in a nursing home. But that was before dementia ever entered the picture. And, you know, children of elders with dementia. I had a young man, well, he was probably in his 30s, come in to visit his mother. And one day he came into my office after visiting her. He was crying. He was sobbing. He said, I can't do this. I just can't do this anymore. I can't sit and watch her decline. I said, you don't have to. 
She doesn't remember whether you've been here or not. And we are not going to judge you. If you cannot handle it, don't come. Please stop coming. That was for his own mental health. So I want you to know it's not at all unusual for the caregiver to die before the elder with dementia because of the stress. I've seen it happen. And my own mother had many ER visits due to her stress before my father passed on. We were sure she was going to die first because she was always in the ER for her heart. Luckily, she didn't. Uh, I had a woman call me one day and said, my doctor told me I had to call you for you to come and talk to me because if I don't get my blood pressure down, I'm going to die. And I'm upset because my husband has dementia. Well, I will do that. So I asked what her problem was. And I, I actually have one, that story in here in my book, and it's called He's Selling All My Fur Coats. And um, she did. She had very high blood pressure, and we tried different medications, and she was still. And he was a difficult person to live with because he was a uh, lifelong uh, Army or Air Force or something. So he had that mentality, you know. Why are you selling her fur coats? Well, she doesn't need them all, and we're getting older. You know, we don't need them. Okay, um, go in the kitchen and there's this bowl on the table filled with pills of all kinds. I said, what's this? Oh, those are my pills. How do you know which ones to take? I said, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I gave her suggestions and I pretended to be, I, well, I, I said I was a nurse there to help out. Well, first I, I was there just to try on the fur coats. And my idea was to, uh, at some point, hide the fur coats and tell, tell him that I, or I could come in and take them all and she could put them in storage somewhere, tell them that they were sold. But as for, you know, getting some help for her, I read her obituary in the paper several months later. She just couldn't get rid of enough stress to outlive. And that's very sad. So every caregiver should be asking themselves and the people around them, is it just getting too much for me now? What do you think? And they'll tell you, hopefully, truthfully, and I hope you listen. Often an elderly caregiver will be forced to place their loved one in a facility once that loved one becomes incontinent and they can't deal with that. Um, possibly the final straw might be when the loved one starts to wander and goes outside and wants to walk home because the home they have in their mind is when they were 20 years old. This is not where they live now. Maybe it's when that elder starts a fire in the kitchen or tries to flush their underwear down the toilet causes a flood. Every family is different. The decision is very personal and everyone just hopes and prays that the caregiver makes the decision before their own health is impaired. This is what I tell my clients. Start looking now at facilities. Get your loved one's name on waiting lists. You can always decline if you're not ready. And they'll keep you on the list. But at least you have a plan for when the crisis occurs. Not if the crisis occurs, when the crisis occurs. There's going to be a crisis. When the time comes, that elder's level of mobility will often be the determining factor as to where they need to be placed. If they fall and break a hip, they're going to have to go to the hospital, have surgery, and then to rehab, and then from rehab, probably to a facility. So if they're already on that facility's waiting list, it's easier because you've already done the legwork. 
if there's still someone who can walk and escape from a facility, then a secure facility, dementia dedicated, is probably the best in my opinion. Um, it's less expensive than a skilled facility, but it's still expensive. What do you look for in a facility? That's another whole day talk. But in a nutshell, is everybody there, the residents and the staff, calm and happy? Do the staff have dementia training? Is, is the facility secure? Is it clean? Okay, I want to talk about caregiver stress. So I've given you a handout about that. Do any of you display any of these signs of caregiver stress on a daily basis? Helplessness, irritability, anger, anxiety, depression, sadness. I've included a whole list of symptoms of depression just for you to ponder because it's so crucial that you recognize the symptoms and signs of, de of depression so you can take steps to reduce it. That includes seeing your doctor for an antidepressant if it's needed. I, I don't know how many people have told me, this drug saved my marriage. I think this drug saved my life. It's true. And, you know, people are just, it's like they have blinders on. They're just trying to get through today and keep this person safe, happy, and healthy. They don't look over here and they don't look over there. They just get through the day. They don't think about themselves. They don't think about these symptoms, irritability, anger, anxiety, sadness. Denial, social withdrawal, isolation. That's almost inevitable unless you work really hard not to isolate that elder with dementia. And when you do isolate them, their dementia will progress faster. And your chances of getting Alzheimer's increase when you are uh, depressed and you're isolated. And when that person with dementia is isolated with just you in the house, occasional visitor now and then, what happens when you have to put that person in a very social environment in a facility? Much harder for them to adjust. Exhaustion, denial. I don't know how many times it's usually, in my experience, it was usually spouses, men, um, who were in denial that their wife had dementia. No, she's just a little forgetful. As soon as we get this medicine fixed, she's going to come around again. Yesterday, she was real good. You know, what do you do with it? I guess you just go along with them until reality smacks them upside the head because if denial is serving a purpose for them in that moment, maybe they can't face reality at that time. Sleeplessness, oh my gosh. That's another whole two-day talk <laughs> called sleep hygiene. Uh, and because you can't sleep, you're exhausted, you don't have concentration, you have financial worries, it snowballs. Health problems. Hypertension, that silent killer. It's not called a silent killer for nothing. You don't even know you have it sometimes. You can gain weight. You can have worsening of your existing health problems due to lack of time. Or it's just too much effort to seek care. Because maybe you don't have someone who will come in and sit with this person while you go to the doctor. And heaven forbid you take them with you to the doctor. <laughs> okay, so what happens in our brains when we perceive negative stress? What happens is 
a boatload of cortisol and adrenaline get dumped into our brains and floods through our bodies. And this is what gives you the ability to fight what's coming towards you or flee, fight or flight. Okay, so cortisol and adrenaline, which is wonderful. We, we were adapted to have this protective mechanism so that when the saber-toothed tiger jumped out of the weeds, we either fought them or ran. Well, we didn't ran, run far, but um, anyway, this is where your brain is really stupid. Your brain cannot tell the difference between a real or perceived threat. Okay, say you stumbled on an escalator once going down and you almost fell, but you didn't quite. So every time you come to an escalator, what, what are you gonna think of? Well, I guarantee when you stumble, you had a lot of cortisol and adrenaline rushing through your system. Your heart sped up, you were getting short of breath. <sighs> Now, every time you come to that escalator, your brain says, escalator alert, dumps that cortisol and adrenaline back into your body because all it sees is escalator. All it sees is saber tooth tiger. It can't tell it's not necessarily gonna happen. <laughs> this is where you can have some effect on reducing the stress in your life. You have to know this is this is not a real threat. It's a possibility, but it's likely not to happen. Okay, not going to happen. So I'm not going to think about the negative thoughts right now. I'm going to take some deep breathing exercises and get through it. This truly will help you with your health and avoid those negative effects of all of the cortisol and adrenaline because repeated um, ambushes of adrenaline and cortisol in your body wears on all of your body organs and your brain and it's not a good thing. So, and as I said, chronic high levels of stress increase your chances of getting Alzheimer's. Combating stress, support group, now, they change all the time in state college. And so I can't give you specifics as to whether there are any right now or where they are. You can call facilities. Juniper Village had one the last time I heard. Um, support groups are wonderful. And I advise all my clients to go to them. And it was usually the men that would say, why do I need to go listen to a bunch of men talk, a bunch of people talk about their problems when I have enough problems on my own? Well, that's true. They do talk about their problems, but you know what? They also have some solutions for you. Oh yes, my wife used to do that and we did this and it was fine. And I can't count the times where I have nagged at these people for so long to get to a support group that when they finally did, they didn't stop after their loved one passed on because they had so much to give and to share. So hydration, hydration is important no matter how old you are. Breathing right and frequently, deep breaths, in and out, exercise, stretches, Time away, just getting away from that person with dementia. Crucial, crucial. How many of you love, love, love your children? How many of you love, love, love to get away from them for short <laughs> periods of time? It's just like that. It is. Many vacations. I don't care if it's going upstairs and sitting down, closing the door and reading a book. When you have someone to sit with your husband or walk with him around the neighborhood. Journaling can help some people. Proper eating, always important because you want to watch that weight gain. Sleep hygiene, again, 
another whole two day talk. Uh, psychological or pastoral counseling can be very, very helpful. Ask for and allow others to help you. Do any of you have friends who, when you're asked to come over for dinner, you say, what can I bring? They say, nothing. And you come over for dinner, you have a lovely dinner. No, no, do not get up. Do not help lick these dishes. Do not help me in the kitchen. <laughs> you know, come on. You're my friend. I want to help. Okay, so what's that person going to be like when they have a loved one with dementia? They're going to be like, I have to do this. I can't ask anyone else for help because this is my problem. And they're going to probably die before their loved one because they're not going to get any help or respite. You've got to ask for and allow others to help you. And like I said, even if it's just for a half an hour, and remember, seeing other faces, talking to other people is really good for that person with dementia, keeping them socialized. Okay, when you can figure out how to decrease those stressors, then what's the impact of your improved mental and physical health on that person with dementia? Well, they often mirror the feelings that they perceive in the people around them. If you're happy and you've got the music on and you're singing, they're probably going to join you. If you're sitting there working on your checkbook and swearing, they might join you. I don't know. Um, and as I said before, when they are calm and happy, then that helps you be calm and happy too. Some resources available to help you. I've listed a couple at the bottom, Dr. Michael Keel. He does um, say you don't want your loved one driving anymore, but you can't imagine how you're going to get those keys from them. And a doctor is just a little bit leery about asking for them. Call Dr. Keel's office, set up an appointment for a neuropsychological exam and assessment, and they don't do a driving test. What they do is assess for whether they think this person would be capable of safely driving. And so then it can be the doctor's duty to tell them that. <laughs> you don't have to be the bad guy. Um, as far as I know, there's no geropsychiatrists in this area. Geriatricians or neurologists would probably be your best bet uh, for healthcare. You can always request uh, a dementia workup if you suspect dementia. You need to get that diagnosis on their medical record because the medications that we have available now, they work better for a longer period of time the earlier they're started. So if you're waiting until the later stages, they're probably not going to help at all. So get that diagnosis. And they can get really close to that diagnosis. And they should be able to. Um, so books. Jacqueline Marcel wrote this book, Elder Rage, or Take My Father, Please. She writes with such a sense of humor. I don't know how she maintained her humor. But her parents, both of them had dementia. And she had to call the cops on her father multiple times. He actually tried to choke her one time. So she writes this very helpful book and encourages people that if your loved one is, is at all has a penchant for uh, getting angry or physical, you know, things that you can do. So Elder Rage, and you can come up and look at these. And this book is written by my friend, uh, Dr. Atel Lord. Her husband, Larry, had dementia, and um, she wrote this book called Alzheimer's and Dementia Coaching. It's, it's a pretty easy read. And then my book, 
Are any of you familiar with my book? It's called Love, Laughter, and Mayhem. Caregiver Survival Manual for Living with a Person with Dementia. It's a, a series of short stories about people with dementia that I've known and loved and worked with in my years as a nurse. And every story has a lesson to teach about how to better care for that elder or to care for yourself as a caregiver because you're probably not doing a good enough job. It's a very easy read. Um, and then, I don't know, did any of you see the AARP bulletin in March where it talks about the future of Alzheimer's, why doctors have new hope about the disease and what that means for you? Now, this was in the March issue. It's a big article, and it's mostly talking about the latest drug that they came out with for dementia, Lacanamab. I don't know if that's how you say it or not, but that's how I say it. And it targets amyloid plaques in the brain. Now, many researchers across the globe are working on other angles of attack, not just the plaques, but the tangles and all kinds of things. Some of these have reached testing the drugs on patient stage. So there's a lot coming out testing on patients. And one thing I was surprised to not find in this AARP article in March was the notice that there's a huge Alzheimer's breakthrough and scientists say the new jab, as soon as you hear jab, you think of the UK, could transform lives. Millions of people could be spared the agony of living with Alzheimer's thanks to the development of a game-changing vaccine. Hmm. They're already testing it on people in the UK and Australia and the US. And they're hoping to have the data collected to present in July, I think, in the US. So isn't that good news? Yeah. Um, this was dated Saturday, March 30th. Um, it's designed to remove toxic proteins from the brain before they cause damage. Could be widely available within five years carried out in five centers across the UK, including Oxford and Cambridge University, as well as centers in Europe and the US. Um, the first results will be presented at a conference in Philadelphia in the US in July. So uh, mild side effects. So that is just really, really promising news to me. And uh, let's see. Oh, they're also testing it on Down syndrome patients because uh, Down syndrome people, if they live long enough, pretty much all of them will get Alzheimer's. And that is because of um, the protein, their brain, they have a gene that overproduces the toxic amyloid protein. And so they're testing it on that, that uh, group of people as well. So you can come up and look at this if you like. And this magazine called Alzheimer's Today, it's from the Alzheimer's Foundation of America, AFA, not Alzheimer's Association, the AFA. This is free. All you have to do, there's some cards in here. All you have to do is send them your name and address, and they will send this to you every month or however often they send it out. Free. It's got great articles in it. So please come up and look these things over. Does anyone have, oh, I just, one last thing. Um, prevention. There are modifiable health risks to prevent getting any type of dementia, except the inherited, well, even then it helps, the inherited kind of Alzheimer's, which is kind of rare. So high blood pressure, obesity, physical inactivity, anything, anything that restricts the flow of blood 
and, and thus oxygen <laughs> from your body to your brain will increase your chances of getting some type of dementia. Okay, so that's important to remember. Any questions? Shout them out, please. <laughs> um, so are there, are there different medications for different uh, dementia types? Yes. Um, the question was, are there different medications for different types of dementia? First of all, it's always a guessing game when you're talking about drugs and dementia. Because even if it works well, six months down the road, it might not, because the brain is going to change. Um, Lewy body dementia, you heard me talk about, just mention that. Do you know what Lewy body is? A different kind of dementia. My father had Lewy body. It's very, very important that if they diagnose dementia, that they either rule it out or say it is Lewy body. Because if they give that person with Lewy body some of the drugs that they give for behavior control in other dementias, it will make Lewy body worse and they die quicker. Mm. So it's important that they get that either confirmed or ruled out. Um, so the dementia drugs, they're few and far between. The best option that we have now that I know of is um, the combination drug Manzarek. Spell it, please. N as in Nancy, A-M as in Mary, Z-A-R-I-C. Okay. Um, it, I've seen that drug do wonders. Now, not everyone can take it. And sometimes the side effects um, might be, you know, diarrhea, which is not fun in a person with dementia. So again, it's a big guessing game. You start very low dose and start slow. Um, and like I say, in a number of, we had a woman, a man bringing his wife into a dementia dedicated assisted living. And as I said, they're, they're expensive. And he was paying thousands of dollars every month out of pocket for her drugs. And I said to him, okay, this is a talk you need to have with the doctor. Is it necessary for her to be on these high cost dementia drugs when this is a progressive condition? And we don't know if it's having a positive effect on her. Usually you don't know until you take it away and then they nose dive and you can't get it back if you start it again. I said, that's one option. Another option is um, she was on uh, a blood thinner. I said, what about aspirin? So we went through the meds and I said, you need to talk with your family because if you decide to take some of these drugs away, she may go downhill very quickly. Is that something you're willing to live with? Turns out it was. The family decided we're going to take these drugs away rather than have dad move into the poorhouse when mom's going to die anyway. She did take a nosedive and she died a number of months later, but at least he wasn't bankrupt. This man center that you speak of, is, are you talking for Louie body or are you talking? Dementia. Uh, about what? The drug. Okay, so Lewy body is is just different. It's not been studied. Um, it's an amzeric. Mm -hmm. It has not been studied in Lewy body. Um, my father had Lewy body dementia, and he was in the boondocks in Oregon. And the doctor told my mom he has Alzheimer's. I said, he does not have Alzheimer's. He has classic Lewy body dementia. 
So I asked for, um, I don't even remember what medication it was now. They gave it to him, but they started not at the bottom dose, they started in the middle and he got sick. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's, you can try it. If the doctor's willing to try it, fine. It's always the dressing room. If it's my parent, I might be willing to try something that's not been approved for. They always, often, will go off-label on medications. Well, it's not been tested in this, but I'll try it. Can I just add one thing? Uh, my name is Jody Morgan, and I am a transit extension. So all these medications are treating the symptoms. So the doctor can see the symptom, and they are treating it. So they might not be able to tell which kind of dementia your loved one has, because sometimes they can have mixed dementia. So they can have some symptoms of Alzheimer's, symptoms of some uh, other front, front strokes. strokes, some strokes and others. So the doctors can treat the symptoms, but there is no medication for the dementia itself. Yeah. So that's exactly. why they use the Thank you for saying it. Yeah, mixed dementia. And a lot of people have mixed dementias yes. because they've had high blood pressure or obesity or high cholesterol for years and they've had strokes in their brain. So strokes in the brain will cause dementia. So they have dementia from that, plus maybe they have Alzheimer's. So, or they have a psychiatric disorder. <laughs> How do you know? Is this the schizophrenia? Or is this the Alzheimer's? Let's try a pill and see. <laughs> we, it's really hard, really hard with medicine. And the family, you know, it's the toughest thing you'll ever have to live through with this. It, it's just, you're watching your loved one die, one brain cell at a time. I have that question too. How well are they diagnosing these patients? I'm here to support some friends that I see going through this. And my question, and my here to learn about this, is just what you're saying. It seems that it's so difficult to get a good diagnosis. My one friend's son, when I asked, well, what's the diagnosis? I don't know, they just give her a shot and give her a pill. And he wasn't educated to, let's go to the <clears throat> neuropsychological assessment. Yes. And you know, so I asked if I could go with him when he took his mother to, to the doctor. And I started asking the doctor some pointed questions. And then the doctor, after that, referred the mother to uh, a neurologist who then took her license away. Yes. And now, now I'm feeling yeah, that, well, I don't, it's the bad guy, yeah, but I'm trying to figure out how do I respond to her when I read all the literature and I want to be a better friend. How, I read all the literature about we're not supposed to argue with them, we're not, we're supposed to make them feel good, we're not. Well, Just commiserate not really, with there's me. nothing I can say to make yeah. her feel good when she calls me 16 times a day to tell me that they took her license away. And today she called before I came here to say she was at a friend's house and she couldn't get home. And I said, well, where is the friend? Well, she left. <laughs> and she said it was all right for me to stay here. Oh, my gosh. But I'm not supposed to argue with her. I'm not supposed to tell her no. You're at home. I mean, we started writing on our whiteboard for her to go and look at where she lived and go look in the closet to see her clothes there and know that she was home. She sees an imaginary, she has an imaginary yeah. pet. That so out, if, if the neurologist can give her something for her anxiety? Well, no, they never, they had never really thoroughly diagnosed her to the point that now she's going to have the CAT scan and the EMG. Okay. Okay. Uh, so hopefully that's coming. And how hard is that once you go through that? And like you said, you spend. They can all have. Money. Pardon me, I'm having a power surge. 
um, <laughs> they can get it with pretty good accuracy with scans, blood tests, and the family's input about the behaviors. Okay, they can they can get it within you know a pretty good percentage point. Um, and it's when it's mixed dementias that makes it a little bit harder. And they, they will often say it's probably mixed dementia, <clears throat> which means, you know, instead of one big strike, you have two strikes. So when she has this brain key and the EEG and the CAT key and whatever they're called, what are the... They're looking at the that? size of the hippocampus. So in Alzheimer's, you're going to see probably shrinkage of the hippocampus. This is where your short-term memories go to be stored. And this is why short-term memory loss is a hallmark of Alzheimer's, because your hippocampus is shrinking and you can't remember what you had for breakfast this morning. Okay. Um, so they're looking at the, the structures of the brain, the hippocampus. Are they seeing um, some kind of uh, shrinkage of the frontal lobes or frontotemporal dementia? Are they seeing excess fluid in the brain? Because that creates a type of dementia that can be cured. Could um, it be a brain tumor? Mm -hmm. I think about a brain tumor. Oh, exactly. Exactly. So brain tumor. you start treating her for dementia, Alzheimer's, and everything before they ever took the test, which yeah. I'm not understanding. Because the here. tests are expensive. <laughs> and, you know. They think they know already, but if you're, if, if this is my mother or father, I'm going to say, you know, I really want these tests done because I want to be sure we're heading in the right direction. Thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Um, so um, my father has some short-term memory loss. Um, but on the inconsequential things like, you know, what's the movie today that we're playing? Or, you know, is it a Thursday or a Tuesday? Well, not Thursday. But if he went and visited my cousins yesterday, he will be able to tell me everything that happened during that event because it was special and significant. So at what, what should we be looking for? At what point should we you know, discuss getting a neurologist involved to see if, if it could Is be he something. worried about forgetting things? If he's saying, I can't remember anything anymore, then he's noticing something has changed. Mm -hmm. If he's um, <coughs> a good example might be um, forgetting where they, completely forgetting where they parked the car. Mm -hmm. Or um, going to the grocery store, but not going to the grocery store, instead of going to the hardware store, and wondering what they were supposed to be doing. That kind of forgetting. Um, so you, I don't think you would need to get the doctor. I mean, everybody, all of us on our yearly doctor visits should have the mini mental status exam given to us, the memory and thinking tests. Because how else are they going to find out if there's a decline if they do it every year? And if they see a decline, and you can call the doctor's office ahead of time and say, I want you to do a dementia workup, which means blood work. They're going to check for vitamin B B12 deficiency. If you have a true vitamin B12 deficiency because your gut can't pull B12 out of the food anymore, and that the pills don't help, you need the shots. You will act like you have Alzheimer's. And once you get the shot, it goes away. Uh, true depression, major depression, you will act like you have Alzheimer's. So that's why it's important to get that settled. Yeah, um, we, we definitely saw that. He was, pardon? He was depressed and stressed, and the memory was shot, and I was worried. And then as soon as that alleviated. We could have an hour conversation about trips that we took 
Yeah. Now my dad had Lewy body dementia, and that does not have short-term memory loss in the beginning, like Alzheimer's. He would remember that he was in a store with mom, and he would know not to go out of the store usually, but he would always lose her. Or if he was angry with her, he would remain angry with her and know he was angry with her for two or three days. Cindy, I have somebody online with a question. I'll, I'll read it to you. My mom has short-term memory loss. She knows who I am. She knows she doesn't drive anymore, but she can't remember simple things anymore like taking her pills. Any suggestions to help with routines? There and are numerous pill dispensers on the market that will can be programmed to open the drawer or sound an alarm at a certain time for these pills. And they have to be loaded in a certain way. Or um, to have somebody stop by to hand the pills to her. Um, he, con he continued and said, she does well when we're at the neurologist and she's been taking Donna Pizzell. Yes, but it doesn't seem to help. Then I would suggest that she ask whether if she's been on Donepazil for a little while, can they add a low dose of memantine or Namenda? Now, those two drugs together, Donepazil and memantine, are the Namzeric. Okay, so if they're just on the Donepazil, Aricept, if they're just on the Aricept, then ask if memantine or Namenda can be added. Low dose slow start and you might see some improvement there okay yeah yeah but medications you need to keep them out of their reach because they're not going to remember to take them right other questions yes how would you suggest that we react they are so sure that there is this imaginary pet that got out. And they're so full of anxiety. We're not supposed to say, don't have, there's no other pet. Okay, the imaginary pet got out. Okay. Oh my goodness, not again. How do you think that happened? Okay, so they tell the story. Okay. I just want you to calm down because I have it under control. Let me make a couple phone calls and we'll have people out there. There are people that go and look for your pets for you. So you don't have to run around looking for them. Or maybe if it's a nice day and you want to take a walk, go walk around and look. But then you pretend to make a phone call and you say, you know, describe the pet. Say, okay, that's taken care of. Now we just have to wait and get their mind on something else. Yeah. This gentleman said thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Does anyone want to look at these books? This, my book is available for sale, autographed. 